Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing this morning? Good. Happy to see you. Uh, we've been doing this uh, series on uh, tongues of fire. Again, uh, please don't do this at home. It's not about the lighting our tongues on fire, but it's a spiritual metaphor for using our, the power of our tongues and the words that we speak. And over the last couple of weeks, we've looked at a lot of different topics. Um, last, uh, we started off by emphasizing these three truths that we should remember about the power of our words. Number one is they come from God. God has given us an amazing power in our words and our gift from God to be used for good. However, those powerful words can either build us up or tear us down, right? Just like the song said, word can build us up and worlds can tear us down. So we want to pay attention to what we're doing with our words. And how we use our words shapes the quality of our experience and the quality of our lives. So <clears throat> with that, this week we're talking about the power of words and the art of confrontation. Now, actually, this sermon wasn't one I was so enthusiastic about. It kind of picks up off of last week, you know, speaking up, right? But uh, I'm a bit uncomfortable with confronting people with, uh, with confrontation kind of stuff. It's just like one of the challenges I have to work on. Um, yeah, a couple of weeks ago, even in my office, I had the experience where one of my coworkers, you know, asked me, you know, said, oh, you know, can we uh, meet together and just talk about this project we're working on? I said, oh, sure. So we sat down and, spot, and she explained to me that actually she was having some problems with my work, with what I was doing. You know, that we were working together and I, my job is to run the data and, and calculate numbers and pass that on to someone else who's going to be writing a report. And um, you know, I'm not that of an organized person, and uh, maybe I put it off, and I had a number of different projects that I was doing, and there was got delayed for that particular project. And she's saying, you know, I really needed those numbers, and you didn't have them. It's kind of frustrating. <laughs> and so, you know, I felt pretty uncomfortable. You know, it was kind of like, you know, I was embarrassed in the first place because I, you know, I want, I want to be a good partner, a good teammate, you know, and, and thing. I felt embarrassed and uncomfortable. But on the other hand, I was grateful that, that she brought it to my attention because I do want to do well. And I do want our projects to succeed and things like that. So uh, by confronting me and bringing this up to me, we could actually improve um, our team and improve the work we're doing. So <clears throat> this topic is something that we, we want to uh, take on. But the issue of confrontation is kind of tricky. It's kind of tricky. Here's a, um, a verse from Proverbs. It says, wounds made by a friend are intended to help. So she confronted me on the issue for the purpose of helping. But an enemy's kisses, even if it sounds good, are too much to bear. So again, our words, if they're done with the attitude of, I want to help, I want to solve a problem, coming from a friend, that brings healing. Mm -hmm. But from an enemy, even they can sound really good, <laughs> but they can really hurt. So, <clears throat> what I want to talk about today is heavenly confrontation. And the definition I'm going to use for that is a meeting between two friends, right? For the purpose of restoring godliness or goodness in, in our lives. And <clears throat> this topic, this idea of restoring goodness, that's what we want to focus on. Now, I'm a little bit nervous. You know, here I'm making this topic, the art of confrontation that afterwards we're going to have a very um, uh, uh, contiguous uh, conversation at lunchtime. You know, there's going to be a lot of confrontation over the lunch table, okay? So that's not where we're going. Remember, the conversation is about two friends for the purpose of restoring goodness. In fact, 80% of the time, things that we feel like, oh, I really need to confront that person over, we really don't. You know, a lot of times we're just doing it for the wrong motivation. So, Remember, we're looking at heavenly confrontation for the purpose of building up and, and, and bringing something better. So I'm going to go through five steps that we can, uh, we can deal with when addressing uh, confrontation in a heavenly way. So the very first place that we should start is we need to make sure that we're following God's leadership on this issue. And we may feel like we have a problem with someone, you know, what they're doing, the way they're behaving. It's like, oh, you know, I really need to confront that person and, and change their behavior or something. But we don't want to just move from our own, own point of view. We really want to take God's perspective and God's heart on these kinds of issues in these situations. So 
Here's four questions that it's useful to ask uh, myself before I leap into confrontation. Number one, is this an issue that's actually causing, is it dishonoring God? Is it a, is it a problem that maybe uh, it, that person represents the church or our family or our community? Is God's rep We're all God's representatives. So if that's an issue, then it's something that we need to seriously think about. Yeah, I need to actually have a conversation with that person and confront the issue. Secondly, look at, is it damaging our, my relationship? Because we're committed as brothers and sisters to working out and having a harmonious relationship. So is this an issue or a problem that's actually getting in the way of me being a true brother or sister? You know, a true partner and, and friend? Or is what this person doing actually damaging or causing injury to other people? You know, it's not just about me, it's about, you know, what's the broader influence. And finally, when I think about this person's situation, is their behavior actually difficult and damaging to them? Is it hurting them in their, li in their spiritual life? So these four questions, also, we should confirm before we take on this, this uh, idea of confronting someone through prayer, maybe some study. Uh, God can inspire us and give us insight, too, about that. Maybe uh, this sermon will speak to you. you know, other people might be saying something that, that, that God uses to inspire us to realize, you know, I need to confront and take on this issue or this challenge. Now, the second thing when we're really looking at, at creating a, a heavenly confrontation after first we centered on God and the higher purpose, is it's something that we should do privately. You know, if I think about that, the meeting that I had with my coworker, if in the middle of our staff meeting, she brought up, you know, and Charles doesn't get me the data on time, you know, I would have been much more defensive. I was like, well, it's not my fault, even if it was, you know. I said, like, well, you know, but I had to work on that person's project and that person's project, you know. I would have been much more defensive. Because in the public, I don't want to be embarrassed, right? So when we want to, especially if we're taking on sensitive topics, it's something we should do privately, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. And if that doesn't work, then, you know, with a larger group. But especially one-on-one -on -one is an important heavenly way to begin the process because we're coming from the point of view of a friend, right? A friend who wants things to be better, wants to improve things. That's the motivation. Well. And the third thing is to prepare ahead of time. Here it says, to prepare tactfully, diplomatically. How can I best convey this you know, to my friend that's going to be most beneficial and most helpful to them? Well, when we do that, there's two things that we should look at. Number one, we need to look at our heart. You know, if I'm kind of getting excited and energized, oh, I'm going to confront that person! <laughs> You know, that's probably not the right attitude, you know. If you're too excited and too enthusiastic about hitting that person with this confrontation, maybe you should take a step back and think about it a little bit more. Uh, we really want to check our hearts because the motivation is for healing and bringing, bringing uh, harmony back in the relationship. So checking my heart, you know, prayerfully, thinking, you know, from God's perspective, you know, is this really a, a good thing and how can I best approach this, you know, with a pure heart, a genuine heart of love and concern for the other person. And secondly, this is a practical thing, is prepare in writing what you want to say. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, a lot of times journaling is a very powerful way for me to clarify my thoughts. And a lot of times, if I write down what I want to say to the person, kind of write out what the issue is and what's the concern, a lot of times doing that resolves the issue. Because many times the problem was not as much with them as it was with me. I was having a problem. Maybe, maybe my problem was I need to have more forgiveness for that person. You know, or you know, who knows what it was. Or maybe I didn't see the bigger picture. And by writing it down, it helps remove some of the emotional upset that might be involved and get us clarity. And if we invest that kind of time beforehand, we're making a foundation for success in that conversation. We're making a, a, an offering, a condition that God can also work. Because in the spur of the moment, you know, our emotion, you know, if the person gets immediately defensive, 
and we'll get defensive right back, and you know, conflict happens. Honestly speaking, if we don't take the time to actually write out what we want to say and what we want to address in that confrontation, we think, oh, you know, I don't have too much time. You probably are not ready to make that confrontation. Because if you're not willing to make that investment, because I really want this confrontation to be successful, I really want it to be a positive outcome, if we're not willing to invest the time to prepare for it, then it's less likely to be successful. So preparing and writing is part of preparing our, our thoughts and, and how we want to present it. Now, I want to use an example from, from the Bible, the, the story of uh, King David, yeah, to, to illustrate these, these, these points. Actually, King David, we all know him, he was a shepherd and eventually became the king and and it was the lineage that the Messiah was going to come from. So many, so many things. Well, this is a story about Nathan the prophet. He was a prophet to King David and, uh, and his relationship with the, with the king. And the situation is, this is uh, King David and his adulterous relationship with Bathsheba. I don't know if you remember the story, but uh, King uh, David kind of lusted after the wife of his general Uriah. And so what he did was he sent Uriah, his good general, faithful general, out to the front lines into a situation where he knew he would be killed. And so he was killed. And, he, and, and, and then, and then he, uh, he took Bathsheba and, and they had a child. So it's like, you know, that's not the way God wanted that done. This is not God's desire. So, what does God do? God has to call someone. Who's going to talk to the king? Who's going to tell the king that, man, you are off, off base? Who's going to confront the king about this? Well, Nathan is the prophet who does that. And it's interesting. If you read the full story, Nathan is credited with writing the, the, the book of Chronicles. And, and this comes from the second chapter, uh, the second um, book of Samuel. Um, and Nathan is an amazing guy. He does a lot. He both confronts King David, but also he's one of the biggest supporters for King David. He's really the friend to, to King David. He's the person who stands up for him, even risks his life at some point, we'll read in, in his life story. But here's how the confrontation goes. So first, God calls Nathan. The Lord sent Nathan, the prophet, to tell David this story. Now here's the story that he tells. Now, for me, I, when I'm thinking about, okay, I'm going to prepare for this confrontation, you know, to confront someone about a problem or an issue. Well, this is a bit eloquent. I don't think I'm going to have this kind of story that he does, but it gives you an idea of the kind of preparation to set the mood and the atmosphere to be able to break, you know, to bring difficult news and confront a difficult issue with someone. So here's a story that Nathan tells to David. He says, there were two men in a certain town. One was rich and one was poor. The rich man owned many sheep and cattle. The poor man owned nothing but a little lamb. He had worked hard to buy. He raised that little lamb and it grew up with his children. It ate from the man's own plate and drank from his cup. He cuddled it in his arm like a baby daughter. Right? He loved that, that lamb. One day, a guest arrived at the home of the rich man. But instead of killing a lamb from his own flock for food, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and served it to his guests. Now, he's telling that story to David, right? David, in his early days, was a shepherd right? and he, who loved sheep. You know, he loved taking care of his sheep. So he's definitely hit David in the heart, right? David immediately, here's, here's how the verse goes on. David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to that poor man for the one he stole and for having no pity. So, you know, David definitely he's on board. He says, yeah, this wrong has to be corrected. Well, what Nathan did, you know, is he prepared, you know, this kind of story to tell to David. So he's tactfully bringing up this issue. And then he states the truth in front of him 
compassionately, but straightforward. And what we need to do when we share that, we need to be able to say it clearly and then trust God to be able to work, you know, to stop talking, in other words. Here's what, uh, here's what Nathan then says. Then Nathan said to David, you are that man. The Lord, the God of Israel says, I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you his house and his wives and the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you much, much more. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah and stolen his wife. <clears throat> so, a lot, that's pretty strong, right? Pretty, he goes on and even says, says more and more about it. When we confront someone, first we need to set the base that we're, we're, we're committed to a common base. You know, that we're committed to doing well on this project, working to, together as a team, having a good relationship. But then we need to speak the issue clearly, especially having prepared beforehand, clearly and communicating it. And then we need to be quiet. We need to just listen. Because what easily happens is that we'll keep talking and keep talking and try to make excuses. And I know you really didn't. And I know. And, you know, we could just keep going on and on and start digging ourselves into a little hole. <laughs> Best that we stop right there and listen. Allow them to process. Allow God to work, you know. You know, maybe we stop speaking and we start really praying, right? God, please, you know, help in this conversation that we can resolve this and that God can find joy in our interaction in, in, in the challenge that we're dealing with. So we listen and then we offer uh, grace and support. Our commitment to making this work, to having this work. Here's what, uh, uh, what happened next. David confessed confess to Nathan I have sinned against the Lord so he, he's real clear he's sinned a bit of course he's sinned a bit Israel against Bathsheba against Uriah you know, his nation but most deeply he's sinned against God and then Nathan replies yes but the Lord has forgiven you and you won't die for this sin but there's always consequences right but you have given the enemies of the Lord great opportunity to despise and blaspheme him. So your child will die. So actually that child from David and Bathsheba uh, becomes sick and seven days later dies. During that time, David, it just we read about, he just so grie every day he's crying and crying and he goes to the altar and prays over and over again. And repents right after seven days uh, the child dies so <clears throat> there's always consequences if we don't correct our sin so confrontation also it's really important that we do it as soon as we can so that the sin doesn't increase and go on for too long our commitment is to, to bring in healing and hope so Together as a community, I encourage each one of you too to think, let's commit to a heavenly version of confrontation, right? You know, just, you know, think, I will compassionately confront a friend if it's necessary. There's another side to this as well. We also need to be, able, be people who can receive confrontation when someone, especially out of love, brings to us an issue or a concern that they have with what we're doing, no, we need to prepare our hearts to be able to receive that. So that God can work through it, work through that and heal that relationship, solve that problem and guide us so that we can grow. God is desperate to heal us. God wants, always wants to heal us, to bring healing in our lives. And God will work as much as possible just directly through inspiration, when we pray, um, through studying scripture, uh, through uh, sermons like this, through hearing, God wants to inspire us in our own mind directly. 
But if God can't speak to us directly, God will use the people around us and try to inspire and work to them, you know, working through a friend. We should also look at our lives and say, do we have Nathans in our lives? Do we have people in our lives that we trust to tell us the truth? That we trust to confront us with love when we're off base? Now, for many of us, that's our spouse, <laughs> our partner. But, you know, good friends are important in our lives. People that can confront us when we're off. We need help to stay on course. You know, I was messing up at work, and I didn't even realize the problem that I was causing. Did I want to do that? No. I wanted to solve that. But unless someone brought it to my attention, I could continue doing the same thing. We confront people out of a commitment to love and care for them, not just for ourselves. And when we're challenged, here's a, a verse from Hebrews. Uh, encourage us. Says, Dear child, don't shrug off God's discipline. Don't be crushed by it either. It's the child he loves that he dis disciplines. The child he embraces, he also corrects. So we all need correction to be put on course, right, at different times. Here I want to conclude with just some words from Father Moon. This comes from a book called um, uh, Guidance for uh, the Way of Spiritual Leadership. And all of us are called. We're spiritual leaders. Father Moon says, when you encounter a member, you should not counsel them in front of all members. Right? Remember our first point? Don't embarrass people in public, but one-on-one -on -one in an environment where trust and we can be vulnerable to each other. Holman says, you have to let people feel he did it for our sake. Otherwise, they will scorn you and oppose you, and in the end, Satan will invade. Checking our hearts. You know, if we're doing it for our own purpose, you know, I want to put that person down. I want to, you know, knock that person off their pedestal or whatever, you know. Motivation I have. It's the wrong motivation. Satan loves that. See, confrontation usually has a negative meaning. You know, usually we associate that with trouble. But we want heavenly confrontation. We don't want Satan to be able to invade or touch anything that we do. He gives this example. He says, when I deal with them, I have the attitude, I will forgive you 100 times. I will forgive 100 times all those I come in contact with. This is the fatherly heart. The heart, when we confront someone, is a fatherly or parental heart. This is what we're working to cultivate all the time in our lives. Parental heart and parental perspective. We care about people. That's why we confront. Here's what the, he, the example he gives. He says, if one's own son has been arrested as a robber and a murderer and is facing execution, would a parent say, as he watches his son head toward the execution chamber, it's a good thing you're going to die. You should be killed quickly. <laughs> No. <laughs> Parental heart is such that even if it were possible to forgive even a thousand or ten thousand times, he would want to forgive. He will treat him with tolerance, willing to forgive a thousand times. This is the attitude that we should have when we're confronting someone about a problem or an issue or concern. That we want healing to take place. We want somehow to find a solution. We're willing to forgive over and over again if only we can find a good solution and bring healing. This is the heart that we want to bring to any confrontation and challenge in our life. So, I encourage you. In our lives, sometimes we're being confronted. Sometimes we're called to confront something. But let's keep all of our confrontations heavenly. You know, looking at these five points, you know, Centering always on God. Let God speak through someone if they're confronting me, but also let God speak through me if I want to confront another person. Do it privately. Prepare ahead of time, especially our hearts and words. You know, be clear, state the truth, and listen to the response. Please join me in prayer. <clears throat> Father, Mother God, thank you so much for your presence, your love in our lives. If we think about the many 
mistakes that we've made, how far we are from, from your ideal. We know how, how painful it must be for you to see us often going down the, the wrong track and making mistakes. Heavenly Parent, we pray that through our friends, our community, the people around us, especially those Nathans that you call to speak to us, that Heavenly Parent, we can open our hearts to be able to receive your guidance. Also, Heavenly Parent, that when you call us, we can prepare our hearts deeply before we uh, take on a problem or try to confront someone, that our heart can truly be in the right place that, Heavenly Parent, you can work through us. We know you want uh, an environment of true love and true peace, beginning with our families, our church community, our wider community, and in this entire world. So, Heavenly Parent, we determine both to be the confronters with heavenly love and also willing to receive correction and confrontation with an open heart. Thank you, and as your sons and daughters and as blessed central families, we offer up this prayer. Amen and adieu. Okay, please uh, turn to your neighbor and share about heavenly confrontations.